Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone out there in the Solid State Circuits and EDS uh, channel. Uh, we are very pleased to have today a uh, distinguished talk by Professor Paul Jespers. As part of the Distinguished Talk series promoted by the IEEE uh, chapter in South Brazil. Uh, it's indeed a, an honor and a pleasure uh, to host uh, uh, Paul Jespers uh, and introduce him to, to the audience right now. Uh, we are the chapter coordinators here. I'm Sergio Bampi in Porto Alegre. We coordinate the chapter with uh, uh, four colleagues, professors uh, Vinicius from Federal Pelotas, Professor Felipe from Federal University of Porto Alegre, uh, Professor Sandro from Encinas, and Professor Paulo from Comaceto from Unipampa. Our speaker will talk uh, today, uh, and he has wrote a book on this issue of systematic design of analog circuits. Uh, Professor Jesper is, is an IEEE fellow. Uh, he was the founder of the Microelectronics Lab at the University, uh, at Catholic University of Louvain in Louvain la Nove. Uh, he has had a long career and was visiting professor in many universities, uh, and he has uh, had a prolific uh, scientific contribution to the field. Uh, he served served as IEEE Region Aid Director uh, many years ago, and uh, it's fair to say that. Uh, about 38 years ago, he came to exactly South Brazil to lecture for the first time in South Brazil uh, on the analog design. So welcome, Professor Jespers, and uh, we are very pleased to have you and, and listen to your talk. Good afternoon. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. It's a real pleasure to have this uh, opportunity to give this talk uh, to the South Brazil IEEE chapter, uh, especially because uh, I have so many contacts, I had so many contacts in uh, Porto Alegre and other places in Brazil. I love the place and it's a real pleasure. My only trouble is that I'm not with you at the time, but maybe it's better with the problems, the corona problems we have at the moment, but okay. Um, <laughs> This, this, this is life, this is the way we have to, to act. So, um, yeah, my, my talk will be on the systematic design of analog circuits uh, using pre-computed lookup tables, and you may have noticed that there is a second name. Well, I think that name has to be uh, highlighted. It's Boris Merman from Stanford University, in fact. The content of the lecture today is the result of a book that we wrote together, Boris and me, and uh, I'm pleased to mention his name. And uh, I, 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 we had really a very nice collaboration. This is a result of, I think, two or three, wor three years uh, work through, the, um, through telecommunication. <laughs> okay, let's start. So what do I mean with uh, systematic design of analog circuits? What is the purpose of this presentation? Well, it is essentially to present a systematic methodology for the design of analog circuits in fine line technology. And uh, surprisingly, maybe we are going to focus on manual design. Manual is, means hand calculations or MATLAB scripts, as opposed to what is usually done with CAD tools, driven flow, etc. Let's be, let's see what it means. Um, well, <clears throat> when you do hand driven design, you need models and you need simple models. So the first thing that comes to mind, and I think it's completely valid to do that, is to say, oh yeah, I'm going to use, for instance, the strong inversion uh, model, strong inversion approximation. And if I want to work uh, in weak inversion, I know there is another model which is right, which is quite good as well, is the weak inversion model. It's an exponential model, just like the bipolar transistor. And what you see here is in the middle, 
the dark line represents a real transistor. So you can see the differences between the best fit of a strong inversion approximation and for the weak inversion, which is rather good in, when you go very deep in, 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 uh, in a very low in inversion. <clears throat> you can see also the, the threshold voltage. And in fact, what is important to know is that moderate inversion, the region in between, is the region that is mostly used. Most circuits actually will operate in this region. So what kind of model do we have? Well, neither the weak inversion, neither the strong inversion model will give us what we want. Of course, we can do better than that, and we can go to advanced models. And here are a number of models, the ACM that you're using in South America. Uh, we call it the AKV in, in, in uh, Europe. It's a little, not exactly the same, but uh, SPICE models, BSIM, etc. The nice thing is that these models take into account <clears throat> all second order effects like uh, threshold voltage roll off, uh, drain induced barrier lowering, channel length modulation, mobility degradation, and they are very accurate. But what can you do with this if you want to use this for hand calculations, extended hand calculations in MATLAB, etc.? It's totally impractical. So what most people do is they go to this uh, classical uh, schematic. Uh, you start from the specification. By hand calculation, you have a quadratic model, use hand calculations to evaluate first circuit. Then you're going to compare it with SPICE. Of course, there are differences. And you go back, there is a loop, the red loop, and you do that a number of times improving each time the, the design of your circuit. What we are going to look at is something different. It's what I call the lookup table sizing approach. And the difference you see here is that we're going to do the hand calculations with pre-computed lookup tables, which are directly derived from high-level models, PSP in this case. and. Uh, the nice thing about this is that if we can do this, the circuit we are going to design, when it will be verified compared with the, whoops, wait a minute, when it will be compared with uh, the data from the simulator, but you may expect that the result is almost good. And may, maybe you have to do one, one cycle more, but you can often you can just stay with the result that you have. And the reason therefore is of course that we have been calculating with the same data as those used for spice. So that makes a big difference, of course. And then the problem is, okay, look up there, what do they, what, what, how are they build? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to have here a, a presentation of the lookup tables mechanics. I know that's not very funny, but I think it's important to look how these are built, how we can use them and give some clear ideas about which variables we are going to consider. But most of the talk will be, con will be will consider examples. So we'll see the, the three examples at the end. So just let's look at the mechanics of the lookup table. Okay, this for instance is the, um, we are um, <clears throat> writing an expression uh, for the drain current, the drain current is given by this expression, look up in channel, ID is the variable that we are looking for, and these are all the data we need in order to specify what we are really looking for. In fact, it means that lookup tables are 4D arrays, very, very large arrays, as you will see, uh, and there's one array for each type of, of channel. The channel, it's here. When you see a green background like this, it means this is in fact a MATLAB code. So you can directly use it. And about the variables here, let me just give you some more ideas. In this example, we consider the drain current as a function of the gate to source voltage, the drain to source voltage, the source to bulk voltage eventually, and the gate length. The ranges of these variables are given here. 
not very important to look at that now. Just uh, know that structure like, like VGS and channel VGS means that we are going to consider all gate voltage in a range from 0 to 1.2 in steps of 25 millivolts. And so the upper voltage here that we consider is 1.2. It's going to be 1.2 for VDS and for VSB it's 0.8. The data you have here, the drain current here, is defined for a standard transistor, supposed to be the width of the transistor being something like 10, mic 10 micron. Okay, so if I take that example and I write the expression here, Precise, suppose we say VGS, we want VGS to go from 03 to 07 volts in steps of 0.1 volt. And uh, VDS and VSB, the drain to source voltage and the source to bulk voltage are default values respectively 06 and 0 volt. So we don't have to specify them. We consider, for instance, two gate lengths, 10, uh, 10, uh, 100 nanometers and 50 nanometers. And what we get is a matrix here that gives us the current versus VGS and versus the length. And these points are here on the curve, showing, of course, the <laughs> excellent correspondence because we are using the same thing. This is the full curve, and these are the points that we just computed. <coughs> Excuse me, that we computed. Okay, level two, because there are three levels in these uh, tables. Level two is, uh, I think, more important, is the table of ratios of parameters that are assumed to be width independent. That is very important. We are, go we are going to consider circuits where ID, the, tra the transconductance, the output conductance, the input capacitance, etc. We know these value, these, these quantities vary like the width of the transistor. Of course, it is not true when you are very, very narrow transistors. But in analog circuits, we usually work with very large uh, transistors. Let's say with a W over L, which is quite large. And once you are above 10, 20, or 30, or something like that, you can assume that uh, the, the variables like ID, GM, etc., vary like the width of the transistor. So when you take the ratio, ID of W, which is in fact the drain current density, Okay, uh, you get rid of the width. And that is going to introduce a degree of freedom which will be very useful, as you will see. Other variables, okay, the transconductance efficiency, very important quantity. We will say a few words about it later. GM over GDS, the intrinsic gain, voltage gain. GM over CCG with the transit angular frequency, omega t. And uh, the last one here, but there are more than that. Uh, the last one in the, on the screen is the early voltage, which is ID over GDS. But anyway, it's, it's always the ratio of two quantities which vary like the width. What I suggest now is that we're going to look at each of these variables and look to the, to the, the instruction, but mainly speak about what what they are useful for. Of course, the drain current density is nothing special to say about it. Again, you see an example. This is, looks very similar to the first example. The only difference is that instead of ID here, I'm considering ID over W, and that's why it's called the drain current density. Nothing more to say about that. The second one, GM over ID is very important. Um, I, I, I know mo mo many people use this, but for those who are not too familiar, I want to say a few more words before going further. What is GM over ID? It's the ratio of a small signal quantity over a large signal quantity, which is already a little bit strange. Not so much. In fact, what it really says, and this is the first sentence, how much transconductance do I get per drain current? What we want to have in a, with a transistor is good trans, transconductance, and we, have, we want to work with little current. So the ratio GM over ID is something very important. We would like it to be as large as possible. What does it mean, as large as possible? Well, GM over ID, second line here, GM over ID can be written this way, and then turns out to be, in fact, nothing else than the derivative versus VGS, 
of the lock of the drain current. The slope of the plot representing IDVGS in semi log scale. You see here the characteristic of uh, the drain current in a semi log representation. And this is simply the geometrical slope of this curve. Here you have a maximum slope, almost constant, and then it drops and it gets minimum here. And we, have, we, can, we can identify the, very, the different um, modes of operation, strong inversion, weak inversion, moderate inversion. You see in weak inversion, we have a GM over ID which is almost constant. In fact, there is a limit. It can never be larger than one over UT, which is what you get in bipolar. In weak inversion for a MOS transistor, what you get is this expression. And where the factor n, which is called the subthreshold slope factor, is usually between 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 5. And if you have SOI, of course, there the subthreshold slope factor is much better. It's not equal to 1, but it's getting close to 1. Well, that is the main things that you have to know about uh, GM over ID. Um, another thing is, uh, OK, I'm taking an example first here. So it's still the same, the same instruction type, but what we're looking for is GM over ID. <clears throat> and we are representing GM over ID, not versus VGS, but versus VDS, considering various values of VDS, L. You have different curves here. Let's see, we have an N channel, we have P channel, we have a constant length, we have a constant W, but we have two different drain voltages, and we could have many of these. And all these curves, they come practically together here. They all look the same. Of course, why? Well, be simply because this curve is always the same. The characteristic of any transistor looks similar to that. So what I want to say here is that we're used to operate transistor specifying what is the gate to source voltage. I don't know why this is switching. Right. Um, <clears throat> we know that we usually take the gate to source voltage as, as a reference, but why not doing something different? Why not considering GM over ID as the driving factor? At least what I'm sure of is that if I take GM over ID, I define the mode of operation. I know that I am in moderate inversion if I have a GM over ID 15. No doubt about that. Whichever transistor, N channel, P channel, long channel, uh, SOI, anything, the saying when I say GM over ID 15, I am in moderate inversion. To say that when you drive the transistor with VGS is a little bit more tricky. Uh, your answer will be, okay, I, I, if I know the threshold voltage, I know what, what it should be. Well, what I'm suggesting, and you're going to see that it's what we are doing all through this presentation, is that we give uh, uh, the main role to GM over ID. It becomes a kind of substitute for VGS. Not that we are going to drop it completely, but you will see that VGS, for instance, is the quantity that we compute all at the end. We don't need it. We run everything under GM over ID. And there's a last thing I want to say about GM over ID. It's somewhat different, but <clears throat> if you take the ratio two over GM over ID, it so happens that this is a good approximation, approximate expression of VD sat. It so happens. When you look at VD set, you have the expressions here that you can derive from strong inversion, and weak inversion. And here, you see I'm using the, the, the lookup tables in order to compute VD set. It's very easy because, okay, starting from any, any guess of GM over ID, uh, uh, yes, I can, uh, I can have a first guess of VD set. And as VD set, I can use it in order to compute a new GM over ID, and after two or three runs here, I have a constant value. And this, in fact, is the VD set derived from this theoretical expression, with well, not theoretical, practical expression. And they are represented here. You see the points? This is in weak inversion, and it's almost constant, which is okay, with the weak inversion approximation, three times NUT, something like uh, 
70, 80 millivolts. That's what you see here. And then as we go to strong inversion, then it's becoming proportional to VGS minus VT0. You see it's increasing here. Of course, since this is a log scale, you, you don't see very well where the transistor is saturating, but you see that the trend is the same. It, this is a very good approximation, and it will be very helpful, uh, as you will see, for example, in, uh, when, when, I'm going, when I go to examples. <coughs> uh, there was another quantity, GM over G, GDS. Well, everybody knows that. That's the gain. Uh, if I take the QSM model, it's, uh, I see immediately that the open loop gain is GM over GDS. If I uh, have a capacitive load, then I see I have a frequency response of a first order system, and I can compute in the same time the gain bandwidth product, which is again a ratio, but the ratio of GM over the load capacitance, CL. Okay, no special comments on this. An example, and I think that is more interesting, I'm using the lookup tables here. It's always an N channel. I'm looking to the ratio GM over GDS. And for VGS, I'm still using VGS at this level. Okay, VGS, I'm going to see from weak inversion to strong inversion here. And I have uh, different gate lengths. And it's remarkable to see, uh, well, we know that, that the gain is increasing when we go to some smaller drain currents. If we go to moderate inversion and weak inversion, we have almost a constant gain, which can be very large. This is a transistor, and okay, this is yeah, 400 nanometers. You can have a gain of uh, 130 in this case. <clears throat> okay, next, let's go to GM over CGG. That's the last of the ratios that I will briefly comment. <clears throat> the angular transit frequency. Why is, what is, why is it important? Well, again, I'm using here the uh, QSM model. And when you sort the output of the QSM model and you look at not the grain voltage, it's zero in this case, of course, but the current gain, AI, you can show that it's equal to this expression here. Uh, that means that when omega is equal to the ratio that we consider, which is the angular transit frequency, the gain current is one. It means that the current input, the input here and the output there, the, the two currents are, are same magnitude. Uh, why is this useful? Well, simply to say, be careful. <laughs> Don't go above FT because FT is really the limit where we you cannot use the uh, QSM model in, anymore. You have to go to scattering parameters and things like that. So it's a limit. We are going to respect this limit and say, okay, if I want, for instance, a gain bandwidth of one gigahertz, I will take automatically an FT of 10 gigahertz, which is well below this, this, this uh, limit. And then uh, the results that I obtained were still significant, so I can still use the QSM model. This is an example of this is an example of the uh, sorry this is an example of GM over CGG. I show it because I want to say you don't have to worry about uh, this limitation. Uh, the, the transit frequencies of modern transistors are extremely high. Uh, this is a 60 nanometer uh, technology. I have some examples here for 100, 200, 300, and you see that we are easily above 10 gigahertz. With 100 nanometer, you have a maximum here, but that's in strong inversion, of course, uh, which is about 70 uh, gigahertz. So uh, we can do a lot even though we, we, we don't want to go above the transit frequency. Now, last comment about the last comment about this uh, table, level three, cross lookup tables of one ratio against another. These are really the most interesting tables. I mean, you can, for instance, uh, derive the, the voltage gain uh, by specifying another uh, ratio, for instance, GM over ID. So if I specify GM over ID and L, I can, I can evaluate AV0. 
And I can do the same thing with the transit frequency. And here you have a drawing showing how the transit frequency and the gain vary with GM over ID. So remember, okay, remember, I don't know why it is switching sometimes. Remember that uh, the horizontal scale here represents the, <coughs> the, the operating mode. So when I'm here, I'm in strong inversion. Here I'm in weak inversion. And you see what we all know, uh, you have to work in strong inversion in order to, to have a high FT, but your gain is going down and the opposite is true when you go in, in weak inversion. Now you're going to see that this uh, diagram like this can be extremely useful. And therefore we're going to look to the examples. But before I do that, let me just uh, give this information. Uh, you can find uh, information about the lookup tables, how they are generated, etc. This is uh, the work of uh, Boris Merman. Uh, this work of Boris Merman, and you can uh, you can uh, go to this uh, site in order to see how it uh, how to use how to start uh, such lookup tables. Uh, I, re I recall lookup tables. You have to set them up only once for a given technology, and you can use it ever forever then. Once you change the technology, you have to redo it. You can do it also starting from experimental data. Of course, it's a lot of work. Setting up uh, lookup tables like that is something that uh, well, takes, uh, I, I guess, something like a half day. And uh, the reference is here, there's the book. Uh, you can also you can also access to the online resources of uh, Cambridge University Press, where you will find all the uh, all the um, <clears throat> the figures and uh, the um, MATLAB uh, scripts that are used in the book. So you can access to everything there. Okay. Now, let's go to examples. Okay, so I'm going to show how we can size CMOS circuits and even do the optimiz do optimization with analytic expressions, which is something that is maybe very interesting. The first example I'm going to consider is a common source stage. So I take an example which is extremely simple, I'm going to analyze it, uh, size it deep, deeply, and then we will end with two examples, more complex examples, a little bit faster, a high swing, high resistant current source, and a low noise amplifier. Let's start with the common source state, so it's supposed to be charged by, an, by a P-channel transistor, and uh, let's specify the load capacitance is one picofarad. I want a gain bandwidth product of one gigahertz. Okay, and the question is, well, I want to size the width, the gate length, the drain, in order, for instance, to have maximum uh, low frequency gain. It could be something else. Huh? It could be, for instance, uh, minimize power. But okay, we we don't have time to go to that. Let's take this example, maximizing the low frequency gain. I'm going to split this example in three phases. The first is just the inverting the transistor, below the, the N-channel transistor. And the simple circuit that I can ever consider is this one, common source transistor loaded by a current source, and of course I need this capacitance. Okay. The first step I'm going to take is to define the transit frequency. Since I want a gain bandwidth of one gigahertz, we decide, okay, we take an FT of 10 gigahertz. And now, you see, I'm going to use this uh, diagram you've seen already before, which is uh, FT and AV0 versus GM over ID. I trace the line here, FT, 10 gigahertz, and let's consider, for instance, to begin with a gate length of 100 nanometer. So this is an interesting point. In fact, it defines, it gives me the GM over ID, which is needed. 
in order to achieve 10 gigahertz with a gate length of 100 nanometers. And I can also define the gain. I can also find the gain, which in this case is about 24. Okay. Now, that's not exactly what I want to do. I want to, to do the, the synthesis not by giving a priori values of L, but I want to find what is the L in order to optimize the gain. Well, that's possible. I can do it. I will comment that later. I think it's not needed now. Um, I can do it the following way. I redo the same thing, but now I'm considering another gate length. So this was 100 nanometer. Now I'm going to 200 nanometer here, yeah. 300 nanometer, 400 nanometer. And I see here what is going to be the constant FT locus. What does it mean? Well, when I have an FT of 10 gigahertz, Considering these various gate lengths, I can achieve gains which max with a, a gain which is maximum 40, 41. And I know that this is for a given GM over ID. This is already quite a lot of things that I know. Okay, well, this is the same curve, but it's it's a closer view to the same curve. And you see very well here the maximum gain I obtain it uh, for gain of 41, which corresponds to 220 nanometer. Uh, still assuming that VDS is 06 and VS is, VS is 0 volt. Okay, now, now that I have these things, the maximum gain, the optimum gate length, and the optimum G, uh, GM over ID, it's possible to, to evaluate W and, and, uh, uh, and the current. <clears throat> the load capacity is one picofarad. The gain bandwidth is 10 giga, uh, 1 gigahertz. So the first thing I do is I compute the rain current density. I don't have to explain this expression. It, it's similar to all those you have seen so far. I find the drain current, uh, the, the drain current density, which is 12.8 microamps per micron. And I now compute GM. GM, remember GM over C is the gain bandwidth. C is CL, the bandwidth 2P, 2 pi times FU. Okay, now I have GM. I have GM, and I also know GM over ID, so I know the drain current. And since I know the drain current density, I can find the width. That's already quite a lot of things. And um, okay, this is what I find. 591 microamps and with a width of 46 micron. Uh, I can do better than that because I did not take into account the parasitic capacitance here. So let's suppose we add this. Everything you see here is the same as in the previous slide. But now what I'm going to do is to redo the same computation, not using CL alone, but using CL plus CDD. So I start with CDD equals zero. I recompute, uh, I compute the first value of CDD and I run, I turn in this uh, loop a few times, five times is more than enough. And I'm going to have the result and the result is here. Okay, you see, there are some differences. 609 instead of 591, the width is a little bit more. And this is the value of the parasitic capacitor. So it's about 3% uh, of the load capacitance in this example here. Okay, yeah, that's a question. What about VGS? We didn't use it. We didn't even think about VGS. Well, we didn't need it, as a matter of fact. But we can, there are single circumstances where we say, okay, we would like to have it. Okay, this is another function which is available in the lookup tables. It's called lookup table VGS. And it gives you the VGS, so at the end of your computation, if you know GM over ID or you know the current density. And of course, you have to give some information about the voltages across, across nodes. For instance, here, I specify VDS and VSB, the source to bulk. Uh, it, could be, it could be, for instance, the drain to source, gate to source, and then I can find VSB or v, VGS. There are two expressions like that. So you can, you can always find VGS but you don't need it 
uh, if you don't need it, you just uh, leave it like that, unless uh, up to the moment you have to go to, to really compute it. Okay, next point. I'm going to uh, take a step further and say, okay, now this uh, stage, I'm going to load it. And the first thing I'm going to use, to use here is a resistor. In fact, many circuits in high frequency operate with real resistors, so it's not, it's not an academic example. Oh, okay, what can we say? Well, the low frequency gain is always GM over ID, but I have to take into account the admittance which is represented by the load here. And now, let us divide everything by ID. The interesting thing is that I'm going to have here 1 over RL ID, which is the voltage drop across RL. I can write it this way. That's interesting also. Uh, this is nothing else as the inverse the reciprocal of the early voltage. And this is the difference between VDD and Vout. So I don't have to specify what is going to be RL. What is RL? The gain is fixed as soon as I have the voltage here, whichever resistance I consider. Okay. And this is the way we are going to find uh, the gain. Uh, it's not so complicated. You see, we start here from 1.2 supply voltage, FT 10 gigahertz. The gate length, okay, uh, 110 uh, nanometer, it's the optimal value, but I'll show it in the next slide. And here I consider V out, variable, variable V out from 0.1 to VDD, which 1.8, 1.2. So the first thing I do, you see, it's always the same thing. I fixed the transit frequency, and I take V out as a variable, I compute GM over ID, and having GM over ID, now I can find GDS. And remember, this is what I need, because the gain is given by GM over ID, plus GS over ID, which I just computed here, and then I have VDD minus V out, and the result is here. You see that, okay, the output for maximum gain the output for maximum gain is here somewhere around 04 volts. It's not the middle of, uh, it's not 0.6, it's 04. And the gain is rather poor, but we know that's always the case with resistances. The GM over ID to get the maximum gain in this example is 18. Well, that's, that's really in, in moderate inversion. So none of the classical models is, is able to give you the data that you need. But we don't need models anymore. We take the models that are available, the best models available. Next point. Okay, next point. Okay, that's uh, the, what I call the optimal gate length. In fact, uh, we can do this computation several times with different values of L. And that's what I've done here. And so you see that indeed 1.1 1 .1 is about the place where you have maximum gains, nothing more, nothing more than that. Okay, now, we know a lot of things, but we don't know the actual gate width, the current, the things that, what is the value of the resistance, load resistance. So we have to take into account, again, CL, FU, and we already compute here CDD over W, which is the low, the drain, Parasitic capacitance per micron. And then uh, you recognize here the classical computation giving me ID and W, but in a loop so that I take into consideration CDD. And once I have uh, ID, uh, well, I can find the value of the resistance. And so the result is here. It should come. It doesn't come, I don't know why. No, okay. Now oh, there it is. You see, uh, 368 micron, a resistor of 2.1 kilo ohm, and this is the width of the transistor. So again, W over L is quite large, so the assumption that the quantities vary like the width of the transistor is it's a valid approximation. Okay, next point. Well, this is a spice verification. So, uh, um, we, Boris uh, um, made the spice verification. Um, I don't think I have to comment these results. They are almost the same. Well, of course, 
because the method is using the data which the simulator is using itself. So we have good results, we know that. Now let's go to the common source stage loaded by the p-channel transistor. We know already that when the transistor is loaded by a resistance, the gain is very poor. An ideal current gives us a much better gain, but the ideal load is something which is not feasible. So we have to go to some practice, something practical, and that's the p-channel transistor that we're going to use. So what do we have now? Well, it's always the same expression you see here. GM over ID, GM over GDS, that's the gain of the stage with a, when you have no load, and, and ideal current source, but we have to add GDS, dividing by ID. And in fact, here I have simply, at the denominator, the sum of the reciprocal uh, um, early voltages. Well, that's also interesting, but I because I can immediately see that I cannot, cannot do anything else here, but I can try to minimize uh, this, this variable. So enhance the, 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 enhance the, <coughs> the, the early voltage. Okay. This is a representation. I didn't comment very much the early voltage, but you know the early voltage is the distance that you have between the drain to source voltage and the point on the x-axis where the drain current or drain current density extended slope crosses the horizontal axis. And you can see in this example, again, I'm using the lookup tables, you can see that yeah, this point is varying a little with the uh, drain, the, the gate to source voltage. Gate to source voltage, so I can say also the GM over ID. Here I'm in strong inversion, here I'm in weak inversion. So in weak inversion, VA is smaller, so I had, it's better if you want to achieve a good gain to have to operate in strong inversion. It's a well known fact indeed that uh, this transit, that this uh, op uh, inverter operates best when the transistor here is in strong inversion, whereas this one is in moderate inversion. Okay, but strong inversion, uh, that has a drawback. Because uh, suppose I take a, a strong inversion, let's say 10. Then the VD set is 2 over 10, that is 0 0.5. That means that uh, the output voltage should be should never be larger than a value which is 1.2 minus 05. So I'm seriously limiting the uh, output compliance. And so I see that there is an optimum here to choose. Well, it becomes more or less clearly there. If I say, okay, I want a VD set of 200 millivolts for the load transistor. So that that I have to accept. But less than that is going to cost is very costly. 200 millivolts, all right. That means that the GM over ID that I may consider, the maximum that I may consider is something like 10. Well let's take 10 Siemens per ampere for the GM over ID. Now we go to the we go to the synthesis of the stage. You have first M1, okay, and you see it's always the same thing. We have uh, strange, strange things that happen. Uh, we have uh, a 10 gigahertz transit frequency, and we are looking for uh, GM over uh, GM over ID. Given where th this is a vector, and uh, I'm computing a vector of GM over ID, which I'm combining with the vector of L. This is a matrix. That's why I'm taking the, di the diagonal. And so I have now GM GDS over ID, which is the output conductor of the transistor 
of the lower transistor, M1, divided by double, uh, yeah. And then I'm considering here the low transistor. Here I have a parameter with L2, and exactly the same thing, I'm computing the gain. And this is a 2D uh, representation of the result versus L1, L2. L1, I remember, that is the gate length of the lower transistor, the N channel, and this is the gate length of the P channel. And so you see that, uh, okay, the lower transistor, you need a gate length which is almost constant here, it's about 170. If you increase L2, you can increase the gain, but look, when you go in this direction, you won't get much more gain, and you're going to have a very large transistor, so you have to take uh, some decision. Well, here I took the decision of, of to making L2 equal to 0.5 micron. And then the rest, well, once you have all these data, again the same thing, you're computing the drain current, the width, and you introduce the parasitic capacitance of the, of the drain. And here we have the result again with the spice verification. You have to look to the middle row here. The data, in the middle row here, the data here in the middle, you have L2, O5, L1, 170 nanometer. This is the gain, the maximum gain that we got. The GM over ID of the N-channel transistor. The sizes of the two transistors. This is the drain current. And yeah, at the end, again, we find, we compute the gate to source voltage of both transistors. In red, you will see the spice Verification, this is the frequency response. This is the point at one gigahertz, and this is the gain, which is uh, about 22. And there are also two other lines uh, showing if you change L2, what are you going to, do you benefit of that or not? Well, not so much, it's not going to change uh, so much, but okay, we could go deeper in the discussion, but we don't have time to do that because now, it gets time to go to the other examples. Time is running out. So and here, the last slide I have to compare the the uh, the two the three uh, um, inverters, uh, the ideal current source, the resistive load, and the p-channel. Notice that the gate lengths, the optimal gate lengths, are not the same. And what I want to show you here also is that these three curves correspond to values of TM over ID of the load transistor, which goes to 5, which is deep and strong inversion, to 15, which is moderate inversion. And remember, we said go not below 10. And you see very well that if you do that here, your dynamic range is going to be substantially reduced. So it's a, it's, it's a good illustration of that, what I said. Okay, let's go to the examples. I think I will have time to do just one. Um, let's consider, for instance, the high swing cascode current mirror. I take that example because output impedances of most transistors is what you cannot really represent in an easy way. Uh, but here, since we have the data from the uh, simulator, it will be possible. So I consider this circuit, which is a classical one. Uh, you recognize here the basic current mirror. The current is injected here. The voltage drop across the diode is running the um, common source uh, mirror <coughs> transistor. The output resistance of this transistor is not very high, and that's why we are adding here a cusk code. Uh, we have to fix the bias voltage. And then this transistor, why is it there? Well, not in order to improve the output impedance of the diode or anything like that. No, no, absolutely not. The only reason is that the gate voltage of the two transistors here is usually around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or something like that, maybe 0 0.5. And the drain voltage of this transistor here, we want, we want to keep it as low as possible in order to uh, obtain the best output compliance. So we will have here maybe less than 0.2 volts, and here we may have 0.5. So 
So there is a big difference in voltage drop, voltage drain voltages, if we don't add this. But if we add this transistor, which is the same as this one, we are going to be going automatically to squeeze the voltage here, to put it exactly at the same level here. And so the two currents, the chances are that the two currents are much more equal than before. Well, this is classical. Um, now let's go to the basic current mirror here. And I show you first how we can compute VGS1 here. Okay, how do we do that? Um, well, you see, again, I start um, considering, let, let's say we consider a gate length of 50 nanometer, 500 nanometers, sir. And we, we, did, we, we use a GM over ID, a fixed GM over ID of 20, which is really a, in between weak inversion and moderate inversion. It's still, I think, more or less moderate inversion. So if we have these data, and still using the equations, you've already looked at that, so I don't have to explain it. This loop here is because when we start, we don't know the drain voltage of this transistor, so we have a first estimate here, and we use it in the second run here, and then we can find GD1. And then we can do the same thing for the other transistor, and we come up with these results showing how the drain current of GD3, the, um, the <coughs> mirror varies with the drain voltage. We change the drain voltage here between 0 and 1.20, and this is what we obtain. We can also consider the output resistance here. The output resistance, as you can see, uh, it's not so high. Uh, this is for one micron. Uh, but in fact, you're going to have uh, uh, usually more than that. Uh, the width will be large. And so you come up with usually with 40 kilo ohm or something like that, which is not sufficient. That's the reason why we're going to add the cast code. Now, if we add the cast code, we have really to think very seriously here. What are we going to do here? What about VDS3? If we make it small, we improve the output compliance. The voltage, the output can go to lower values. Okay, but if we take it too small, the output impedance is going to be smaller, so we should increase it. Again, I'm using here the, 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 the same tool in order to represent the output characteristic. It's the... Uh, the output resistance, I'm sorry, the output resistance, considering various GM over ID, 20, 15, 10, so it's weak inversion, moderate inversion, and I show the output characteristic here, and of course, since the resistance is the slope of this curve, you see that, of course, when you go here, you have a very rapid drop because the transistor is no more saturated. We see it clearly. If you take VDSAT as it is defined before, that is 2 over GM over ID here. This is what you get, and that's not enough. You have to add something. 50 millivolts, 100 millivolts. The more you add, the better the output impedance, but at the same time, you're reducing compliance. So the optimum is something like 50 millivolts, and that is, that is a classical value which is used by, by almost everybody. The drain, the... the VD set plus 50 millivolts. Once you have that now, here you see, I'm defining VDS3 as 2 over GM over ID plus 50 millivolts, that's 150 millivolts, okay. Now, the next step is, what about V bias? Well, I know already the GD3, the, the, the drain current density, because I fixed the gate voltage, I have here I fixed not the gate voltage, I fixed the GM over ID of this transistor. Was, I took 20 in the last example. <clears throat> and then, oops, again. Um, <clears throat> that gives me here 150, for 100 millivolts, 150 millivolts, I can call, I, I, I can, okay, sorry, excuse me. Sorry. I know the GM over ID of this transistor. I know the drain to source voltage so I can find the drain current density. Having the drain current density and knowing that this transistor, usually we take a transistor which is similar to this one, knowing the drain to current 
uh, the, the drain current density, I can compute. Uh, I can compute VGS four without difficulty. It's uh, it's done here. And once I have VGS4, I can even go a step further and find what is the output resistance, because all what I need to know now is AV4, and AV4 is the gain, the cascade gain here, the, cas the gain between this node and this node, and this is also the classical expressions. You know, you have to compute the several transconductances, GM, GMB, and GDS, and then you can evaluate the gain, and we find the gain is around 80. So now, we have all the data we need in order to compute the output characteristic, and this is the final result. What you see uh, in continuous lines represent uh, the SPICE simulations, and the points represent the analytic results, which is not so bad, remember that we need to know a lot about the output impedance of transistor, whichever gate length, whichever mode of operation, and everything, of course, is in the in, in the <coughs> in those tables. So, uh, Sergio, uh, what do you want me to do? Do I have to? Uh, so I skip the LNA and go to the final. Well, uh, LNA well, uh, four or five slides. Professor Jespers, uh, you can take a breath or a cup of water, but you can skim through and go fast on the highlights of the LNA, low noise amplifier example, so you can proceed okay. on. We still have time. Okay. I'll do it. Uh, I think there are four or five slides. <clears throat> okay, the LNA that I'm going to consider is the one we, uh, that has been published by Blackmere in the IEEE Solid State Journal of um, 2008. Um, <clears throat> I think I have to rapidly explain for those who are not familiar with this. Uh, the nice thing about this circuit is that, first of all, you have an asymmetric input and you have a symmetric output. You see that the signal here is feeding a cascode circuit, so this has a positive gain and a common source, this has a negative gain, and if we can make these gains equal, we're going to have the signal amplified with different polarities, with opposed polarities, so that we get here at the output a differential signal. That's n number one. Number two is we're working out how to high frequency, and we want the input impedance to be equal to 50 ohm, second in specification. Now the thermal noise, well, in this circuit, the thermal noise that is generated by M1 causes voltage drops of noise across R1 and Rb, which are of opposite sign. Which means that the voltage drop I obtain here, which is going to be amplified by the second stage uh, with a negative gain, I'm going to have here the voltage, uh, noise voltage, with uh, the same polarity as here. So if I can make the gains equal, I'm going to change the noise voltage of this transistor in common mode noise. And since I'm working symmetrical, I don't care about that, in a, at least to some extent. And in fact, the same thing is true for a distortion. Um, so, of course, this is not a zero noise because the noise of the cascode is eliminated, but I don't eliminate this one. But I can now focus on this transistor and optimize it as far as noise. So find the W, the, the drain current of this transistor in the best manner. And I'm going to do that, but rapidly. So here, what you see is the common source stage. I start with this. And I'm taking one parameter. You will not be surprised if, it's, if it is GM over ID. It is the GM over ID of that transistor. I'm considering a series of possibilities from 8 to 20 Siemens per ampere. And I'm, I'm using just the same expressions as the one you've seen before, so I don't have to go in details for that. I can find the gain and I can find VGS. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to look to the first stage, and the first stage M1 here, 
Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to look at the input impedance because I need to have a 50 ohm. So 1 over 50 ohm is equal to 1 over RB and the input impedance looking up here in M1, which is in fact the resistance R1 divided by the gain of the cascode. But since I'm going to make this gain equal to the gain of the second stage, I replace it by AV2 without its sign. And all these quantities, we know them already. So that since we know RS, of course, we can find ID1. Knowing ID1, we can find the drain current. We can find, oops, we can find the resistances RB, R1. We can also specify the width of, of, of um, M1. Now, <clears throat> Now we go to VGS, now we go to the, sec the, the first stage. Where do we need to do? No, okay, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. Now we really have the big problem. How are we going to make the two gains equal? Okay, we did not compute the gain of M1 so far. It's done here. I don't have to comment. It's always the same thing as this expression. So now suppose I have the gain. I have to match the gain of two stages here, which I do with an interpolation. I consider the gain of stage one, the gain of stage two, and I'm consider all possible gate voltages here, VGS is a structure, in order to find what is the VGS one for the GM over ID2, for the um, transconductance efficiency of M2 that I choose, I can for every uh, GM over I2 find the VGS. And so this is what I get here. With the, gate, with the gate voltage, so I know immediately what is the bias voltage. And the step, the next step, what is it? Well, we I'm, now, now we go to uh, classical textbooks. We can compute the noise which is generated by the resistances, the noise which is generated by M2. And the game now is to find, uh, to find a current of M2 because, oh, uh, well, now the game is to find, I think my, my no, okay, doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, I'm, 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 I have ID2, it's not yet determined, huh? you may have noticed I have everything except that ID2. So this becomes a parameter that I'm going to use in order to minimize as much as possible the noise. And uh, in the example that I'm considering here from reasons which I explain in the book, but we don't have time to do it. I take this example here, and now I can find the noise figure versus frequency. And again, you have a spice verification here. No comment, they're almost the same. So conclusion, to conclude. Well, in this presentation, I'm going to read it. We introduced a methodology for the design of CMOS circuits making use of lookup tables. These tables look, list not only currents, but also small signal parameters, as well as ratios of parameters, these, which are assumed to be width independent. The method applies thus primarily to transistors with large W over L, which is the case of analog circuits. Remind, lookup tables are to be set up only once per technology. Having this, you've seen that we can size CMOS analog circuits fixing near exact currents and dimensions without the need to run repeated simulations. This also offers a possibility, and I think that's not a negligible, uh, interesting feature. We can take advantage of analytic expression. So what is in textbooks, but you can work with real values. And that's my final conclusion here. I think that it may be interesting also for our students we have not this frustration we have usually. On one side, we have a book with equations. On the other side, we have data, and we don't know what are the real data we should put in our models, in our circuits. Well, we can do it with this. And that's a message for the students. Okay, I thank you for your attention. Obrigado. That's all what I know in Portuguese. Thank nice, you very uh, much. Thank you very much, you. Professor Jespers, uh, for inspiring for this very interesting uh, design methodology. Uh, many questions have arrived here.
and also some congratulations to your method as well. First question comes from Taimur Rabuski. Uh, he's from South Brazil. Uh, he said that he uh, has used your textbook uh, methodology in his classes for the um, GMRO ID, uh, a lookup table method. And thank you for that. His question is uh, the following. While we build the lookup table, you have to sweep L, VDS, VGS, and VSB, and storing the corresponding DC operating points, GM, ID, and capacitance, CGS, CDS, etc. Uh, he would like to ask you, uh, how would this allow, will allow us to also size circuits for yield? So, uh, especially, yield. yeah, how would this methodology allow us to also size circuits for yield? given that we already have built up all those lookup tables? Um, well, in the book you will find uh, there is a chapter, I think it's number five or four, which is dealing with not exactly the same thing, but um, the impact of uh, uh, slight modifications of the parameters. So. Okay. Um, you can do that. Uh, just look in the book because uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain that without any, any practical example. But yeah, you can you, you can predict what is going to be the impact of the of mismatch on, uh, on characteristics. I think it's rather straightforward to, to, to understand how it works. You just try a number of combinations and you extract from that the data for a given technology. You can do it all, 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 also once. Eh? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Osiria Rose uh, has another question to you, Professor Jespers. Um, the, the person comments that he thinks Lookup tables method is surely a powerful flow, and uh, the comment is uh, creating the code to generate the lookup tables will be time consuming. So uh, he asks, or he or she, I don't know, uh, asking if there is some software or code uh, that is available from uh, the book website, uh, software or code that you can share that generates the lookup tables, and that's a reliable method to generate the lookup tables uh, from uh, SPICE simulations. <clears throat> it's not such a hard job. Uh, I had the experience with uh, a group in France. Uh, they use another technology and they wanted to, to set up lookup tables. Uh, I think it took them maybe a day or, or a half day. Uh, if you're successful, if you don't mistake, if you don't do mistakes, of course. That, uh, how to handle the problem, I can only refer you to the book and to the reference I gave in the lecture, because there is, there is a very extensive explanation of how to, to, to do this. So uh, I think what you need is available, and it's, uh, I've been referencing it, so you can find it in, in, it's in the middle. Do I have to show the, the, the slide? It was about in the middle. Okay. Another question is from Isaias Jr. Uh, Isaias asked if uh, uh, this method, will it, will it work for triad region operation uh, or is it uh, only for uh, transistors in saturation? Uh, he means that uh, uh, supposedly he wants to design for low reverse leakage current using high VT transistors, for instance. His question is, would it be possible to use this uh, methodology that you presented? The answer is yes. Short? Yes, yes. yes. <coughs> yeah, there was an example also. Yeah. You, you, you have, have shown an example. Yeah, there was an example when we looked at 
the voltage drop across the current source, uh, the current mirror transistor. This one is, is operating, uh, uh, not, it's not in, in, in uh, saturation. So, right. But you have to specify the voltage. So anyhow, you have to specify it anyhow, because with short channel, even if you are in, 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 in uh, saturation, you know very well that uh, the drain voltage is a great influence on the drain current. Good. Uh, Professor Sandra Ferreira has a question to you, Professor Jespers. First, he thanks for this inspiring talk and your inspiring methodology that you are spreading now. Uh, his question is, can you comment on the use of this design methodology when targeting noise optimizations? I don't know exactly what uh, what is the meaning of this question. I gave an example at the end, uh, which really is uh, and it's going in the direction that this, this question is going. Uh, the question is about uh, <coughs> can you can you predict noise uh, with this method? And the answer is yes. I didn't mention it, but in the, yeah, maybe I should have told that. Uh, in the lookup tables, you have data about noise uh, of the transistors as well. We exploit these. And so there are functions as well. Uh, I, I can't uh, give you an example so at once. But in the, in the last example I showed, for instance, uh, the noise values of transistor, we, we don't we don't just uh, it's not a wish it's simply those values that are extracted from from the function. So there are there are um, some of the functions here give access to data of noise and you can use them then for the circuit that you are studying. So my answer is yes, there is no problem. You can do that. Of course, okay. you have to look more carefully. But you have to look more carefully what is in the, but again, look to the book or uh, the data of the <coughs> uh, lookup tables and you will find what is needed. I, uh, I suggest that you look in chapter, I think it's chapter five. The LNA is completely explained and it shows you how the data from the lookup tables regarding noise are put to use in order to predict noise. So I think that answers really your question. Okay, now the final question, the last one. Uh, thank you all who uh, made the questions and have been attending the talk. Uh, Taimur Rabuski uh, from Santa Maria also is asking, uh, could you comment, Professor Jespers, a bit on how to apply the te this technique for the calculation of the MOSFET distortion. Uh, he mentions that you, has, you have previously published an ISCAS paper on the distortion using GGM or over ID uh, uh, method. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is a little bit different. Um, again, in the book, you will find, uh, whether it's four or five, I don't remember, there's a chapter uh, where there's a whole section about distortion. Now, uh, there's a little difference here. Uh, to compute, to evaluate the distortion, I needed a model which is uh, uh, able to reproduce weak inversion, strong inversion, moderate inversion, a model like the ACM you use. Well, I did the AKV, but that was a big, big, big difference. And uh, that part is based not on the pickup tables, but on the model, the, uh, as I said, the ACM model. You can evaluate with the ACM model the, uh, what is the distortion. The connection with the lookup tables doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. Thanks for your comment again. On behalf of the of the South Brazil chapter, uh, Professor Jespers, would like to thank you for uh, 
giving this distinguished talk. Uh, you know, uh, the video is available to everyone to, to, to listen to. Uh, and that's, uh, remember, remember that <clears throat> July 82, first time I met you here in South Brazil, and that's 38 years ago when you lectured uh, on analog CMOS design uh, here in, in Brazil. So we thank you a lot for uh, your, your talk and all the dedication you had all those years, uh, culminating now with this book, Cambridge Press on the systematic, systematic analog CMOS design using lookup tables, authored by you and Professor Boris Murman. Again, uh, thanks a lot for your for your talk and uh, your final words uh, to you before we announce the next uh, seminar, the upcoming seminar. Your uh, last <laughs> comments and, and greetings, Professor. Yeah. Let me just uh, say that it was a real pleasure to do this. And uh, I always uh, appreciate so much the contacts I have with with you, with your group uh, of the University Federal de Rio Grande do Sul and the other guys from South Brazil. So it's a real pleasure. Uh, I wish I would be there with you in order to to have a good dinner or a good churrasco with you. <laughs> yeah, we are looking. We are looking forward to meet you again. And uh, for all of you out there uh, in the in the YouTube, you can uh, tune in tune in for the next talk. It will be July 30th. Uh, since this is a joint chapter, solid state circuits and uh, electron device societies, next talk will focus on device characterization. Uh, July 30th, Mario Lanza will speak from China. He is working from China. The talk will be at 9 a.m. to allow him to speak from China. We'll be talking about nanoelectronic characterization of advanced materials using conductive atomic force microscopy, AFM. So looking forward for this next talk. Uh, and uh, on behalf of all the coordinating chapter members here, uh, Professor Filippi, Professor Sandro Ferreira, Professor Vinicius Valduga, Professor Paulo, who helped uh, to stream out this video. Uh, thank you a lot, and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you, uh, speaker and distinguished talk, Professor Jespers, and we'll see you in this channel very soon. Bye-bye. Have a Bye -bye. good week.